Morning, guys. Um, this is the start of your April 14th. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is the start of your DLD uh, that has to do what we're moving into now is something called the English Civil War, the Glorious Revolution, uh, the Commonwealth. OK, and what we're looking at is big changes in the way that the British rule themselves. And it's very, very important. It's going to have a huge impact on um, how Americans rule themselves, because what we're going to see is a lot of the principles that uh, come out of the English uh, Civil War and the Glorious Revolution and something called the English Bill of Rights, we see them dumped, boom, right into what we call our Constitution. And the other thing is it becomes the basis for the Declaration of Independence and the um, reasoning behind the American Revolution. You're going to have to understand when we get to the American Revolution, the reason there's an American Revolution is because the Americans say, hey, our rights as British citizens are being um, impinged on. They're being violated. So because of that, we have a right to revolt. And how do we know that? Well, way back in 1648, when, uh, when the British felt like their rights were being violated, they did the same thing. So, okay, but to understand this, we got to go back, we got to jump back in. Remember when we were last talking about um, the British, we talked about Queen Elizabeth, okay? So we had the Tudors, we had Henry VIII, we had Mary Queen of Scots, and we had Elizabeth. Elizabeth ruled about 45 years, and during her time period, they defeated the Spanish in a war. The Spanish attempted to invade um, England, they, and they were defeated in the famous Spanish Armada. Um, a lot of the disputes over religion settled down during that time period, and generally speaking, people liked Queen Elizabeth. She was referred to as Good Queen Bess. Now, one of the things about that is she uh, and Henry both worked well with Parliament. Now, understand, they believe in two important concepts. They believe that um, kings have absolute power, okay? Kings have absolute power, and God puts the king on the throne. And the king is God's representative on earth. This is the concept of absolutism and something called divine right, the divine right of kings. Where do kings get their power from? Kings get their power directly from God. That's the idea of divine right. So you can't question what a king does because he's representing God. And sometimes we're going to see they even say, well, I'm pretty much God on earth here. Okay. But Henry and Elizabeth would consult with Parliament. They would work with Parliament. And most of the time it involved when they needed to raise money. So when they had to fight the Spanish Armada, Elizabeth called the Parliament in and they approved taxes. Why would they do that? Remember, Magna Carta, no taxation, no taxation without consent from Parliament. So they're asking Parliament uh, for approval. Now, what happens? After 45 years, Elizabeth dies. Elizabeth has no children. She never got married. She never had children. So what are we going to do <coughs> Excuse me, for a successor to Elizabeth? What they do, Parliament goes up to Scotland because Elizabeth's cousin is a guy named James VI. In Scotland, he is James VI. And James the Sixth is her cousin. So what they do is they ask James to not only rule Scotland, but come down and rule England as well. And he becomes James the First of England. Okay? And this is very, very important. He agrees to rule pursuant to uh, customs and traditions in the English law. Things like the Magna Carta, which includes the right of trial by jury, the idea of habeas corpus, that you can't just run around and, uh, throwing people in prison for no reason. You can't just especially imprison your political opponents. 
with no reason. You have to tell them what the charge is. You cannot tax people without the consent of parliament. Okay, remember all that stuff we learned about in first semester. Remember, we were consolidating power and then limiting the power of the king. The English are all about limiting the king's power, and that's what we're going to see uh, increasingly here as we move on. So we had the Magna Carta. We had uh, King Edward during the Hundred Years' War creating the House of Commons, so they have a representation. Um, he also says Parliament should have the power to approve spending by the crown, the power of the purse. And Henry I had created common law that applied to everyone, everywhere. Okay? James comes to the throne. He's an absolutist. He believes in the divine right of kings. Okay, he says the kings actually exercise divine power on earth and they should receive both the affection of the soul and the service of their um, subjects. James spends a lot of time, first of all, I got a video in here for you to watch. You can see it. He spends a lot of time partying. Um, he spends a lot of money on partying. James came from a relatively poor kingdom in Scotland. He's now in England. England is a much richer uh, kingdom, he's got more money at his disposal. He also fights a series of wars that are failures. Um, but he needs not money for this stuff. He also starts to build lots of nice palaces and buildings, mostly to benefit himself. So, when Parliament will not consent to his taxation, what he does is he says, I have the divine right, and he dissolves Parliament. You cannot limit my power in any way. He also has a big clash with uh, a movement within the uh, Anglican Church called the Puritans. The Puritans want to uh, purify the Anglican Church. They want to simplify it. They think it's too high church. They think it looks too much like the Catholic Church. James won't go along with it, so he fights with them. In the end, James dies, and in 1625, his son Charles I takes the throne. Charles I wasn't even supposed to be the king, uh, but his older brothers all died, so he became the king. And it's kind of an irony. He becomes one of the kings who we look at and we say, uh, wow, you really screwed up. And he becomes a focal point of uh, kind of the hatred of the people. But the reality is Charles, for the most part, wanted to do right by his people. Uh, by and large, he was a pretty good king, uh, but he believed firmly in the divine right of kings, and he had this bad habit. If you opposed him, he would throw you in jail without a trial, and he wanted money to fight a series of wars. You're going to see in the videos that I've put in here. He has a series of wars against France. They're just absolute failures, poorly planned. They cost a lot of money. Parliament says, in the end, you only get to uh, get money if you sign something called the Petition of Right. This is a big important concept, the Petition of Right. The Petition of Right says the king's power is to tax is limited. He can only tax if he consents, if he gets the consent of Parliament. So it's a restatement of the Magna Carta. And he cannot go around imprisoning people. Well, Charles won't sign this, and what he does is exactly what his father used to do. He dissolved Parliament. Go home. He sends him home for 11 years. Okay? Now, during that time period, he's going to direct the government on his own. He does a good job. He drains swamps. He builds roads. He has beautifying uh, building projects. He works for the good of his people. Um... He limits unemployment by creating public work uh, programs where people can work. And generally speaking, he wants what's good for his people. He's kind of the opposite of James in a lot of ways. He also has an Archbishop of Canterbury whose name is William Laud. William Laud tries to impose something called the Book of Common Prayer. Everybody in the Anglican Church in the Church of England is going to do the same thing every day. So they map out a service for every day, and they're going to impose this on everybody. Well, ironically, the people in Scotland, where James had come from, 
uh, James, we refer to the kid, the people who rule uh, descended from James as the Stuarts. The Stuarts came from Scotland and the Scots revolt against them. And in 1637, the Scots send an army down to invade England. Well, we, uh, Charles needs money here to fight this, and he calls on Parliament. They've been out 11 years, but now Parliament has a new leader, a new prime minister called John Pym. John Pym says, well, you got to sign the Petition of Right. you got to sign another document called the Great Remonstrance, which is a, just a list of complaints. He forces Pym and Parliament, force Charles to execute several of his advisors, including uh, Laud. They threaten his wife and kids, uh, Charles' wife and kids, so they have to leave the country to be safe. And finally, Charles gets sick of it. In 1642, he sends a bunch of cavalrymen into the House of Parliament. They ride into Parliament itself and try to arrest the leaders. Now it's on like Donkey Kong. This is the English Civil War, and the English Civil War involves two groups, the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers support uh, King Charles. They are mostly aristocrats. They look down on the supporters of Parliament. They call the supporters of Parliament roundheads, making fun of them like they've got a bowl cut on their head. The roundheads support Parliament. They are mostly middle class. They are mostly Puritans. The Cavaliers tend to be staunch Anglicans. Um, the leader of the Roundheads is a guy named Cromwell. And what happens, and you can see it most of it in the video, in 1645, the Roundheads defeat Charles and the Royalists at a place called Naseby. And after Naseby, Charles is arrested and thrown in jail. Now, everybody expects Charles to come back and be the king. Um, they want him to be the king if he agrees to limit his power, and he never does. And he's in uh, prison for about a year and a half, two years, and he refuses and refuses. And finally, the Puritans just put him on trial. Parliament puts him on trial for treason, and they find him guilty, and they have him executed. This is huge. This has never happened in Europe, that a king was executed, and it sends the message, the king is not above the law. The laws apply to kings too, okay? So that's the big message of the English Civil War. The king's power is limited by parliament, okay? So that's going to be what you're going to see. You're going to see a video today, a little bit. You're going to see a couple more tomorrow about the English Civil War and its outcome. Okay? So I'll talk to you later. you got an assignment quiz to do. Okay? And this is all topic 12. Talk to you later.